Good evening and welcome everyone. It is wonderful to be with you this evening. We are so thrilled that you have joined us for this summer's book club pick, The Splendid and the Vile by Eric Larson. Thank you so much to Linda Conradi for being a part of our event tonight. Tonight is being held as a Zoom meeting. So following Linda's comments, then we will have an opportunity for you to join Zoom breakout rooms. And for you that are watching the recording, you will skip over the breakout rooms and just come back for the conclusion of the event. We are just so grateful that you're with us. Look forward to more opportunities for online and in-person events as we head into the fall. And we can't wait to share our next book club pick, which will be announced shortly. So check your email and visit principia.edu slash events for all upcoming events this fall. So Linda, I am so happy to pass it off to you. Linda Conradi is a member of our Principia Lifelong Learning faculty. She's joining us today from her home on the shores of Lake Superior in Duluth, Minnesota. Linda is an avid reader, frequently reading one book a week. We were so thrilled to have Linda join us for the Principia Lifelong Learning summer session in June, where she led a wonderful class called Hooked on Books, and where they read this same book, The Splendid in the Bio. So Linda, without further ado, I will pass it off to you and thank you all so much for being here this evening. Hi everyone, and welcome to the book talk. Um, we are in for a real adventure tonight, uh, going back to World War II. So uh, while I have the um, opening screen up, I just wanted to say, um, that I hope you have enjoyed reading this book. And if you haven't had a chance to read it yet, I hope you'll hear something tonight that maybe will uh, pique your curiosity and that you'll want to pick it up and read it. It's nonfiction, but our author, Eric Larson, is a wonderful storyteller. It almost reads like fiction. So it moves, it moves very quickly from chapter to chapter. And um, I, highly, I highly recommend reading this book. The chapters are very short, so if you don't read for a very long period of time in one sitting, you can just read one or two little short chapters and, and it really helps move it along. But when this book was published in the spring of 2020, our country here in the United States was just heading into that long lockdown and uh, caused by the, the pandemic. And so people were really beginning to isolate and, and life was not normal. Um, so as we read the story of the pluck and courage of the British people that they displayed during the relentless bombing by Germany, 57 consecutive nights, which was known to us now as the Blitz, followed by six more months of nighttime raids. And you can see in the illustration on the cover of um, the original, this was a hardback book that you see, you see in front of you, was one of the nighttime raids and the British people were just so afraid when the moon was full because it gave the bombers just clear view of every, every target that they had. So I, I think it's so interesting that um, there's nothing by happenstance on the cover of a book. And we're going to go into this cover in, in, uh, in just another minute. But um, I wanted to share with you um, the, um, by the way, there is there is a resource sheet that um, Marilee is going to post a link to it for you, and and it will also be available with the talk. And on this resource sheet, I have mentioned several um, podcasts and interviews, a couple of other books that I think are worth uh, reading surrounding this period of time, and also a couple of movies. So um, that will be available to you as well. But one of, one of the, um, just a second, I move on to this next slide. One, uh, there's our author, Eric Larson. And um, one of the um, podcasts that I listen to called The Thoughtful Bro, and Eric Larson is interviewed by Mark Cecil on this one. You can find it on YouTube and it's on my list. Um, Eric Larson says, um, you can't write a book like this without good source material. And so he talks about 
how he follows every trail in the archives, and then he documents every quote. Interestingly enough, he um, somebody oh, he was asked about his process of writing, and he said that he writes one page a day, and he will stop mid sentence. Then the next morning, I thought this was really kind of amusing. He sits down with his cup of coffee and a double stuffed Oreo, and he finishes the sentence. So that's part of his process in writing. He said he has notes everywhere. No one is allowed to come in and clean his office, but he knows what is where. So um, he was asked by this um, interviewer, if Churchill could come back and you could sit down and talk to him, what would you ask him? And Larson said he would ask about the first 24 hours as prime minister. And um, those of you who have had an opportunity to read, to read the book, know that there, there is a reference to what he was thinking when he went to sleep that first night and um, how pleased and honored he was. And it, he kind of felt like it was his destiny to become, to become prime minister. Um, so he zeroes in on this one year, May 10th, 1940 to May 10th, 1941. And this is when he becomes uh, Prime Minister, he takes, the author takes us behind the scenes um, to glimpse life in Churchill's inner circle of government, of his family, and of his friends. And we find as readers um, really wonderful immediate glimpses by the excerpts from the diaries, particularly from young Mary Churchill, Ch uh, Winston's daughter, who's 17, the year that this book um, takes place, that this time takes place. And also his, uh, one of his private secretaries named John Colville. And he kept quite an interesting detailed diary, which apparently in his position was, he really was not supposed to be doing this, but it was his own private diary. And people really didn't know about it until much later when, many years later when he published it, but he purged, he purged a lot of the uh, little interesting snippets about his own personal life and his love for this woman who didn't really return it. It was the excerpts that we have in this book, I think are so, people are so real. There, there's something about writing in a diary that the immediacy of it, you're not um, filtered by distance as when you're writing about something in the past. So the diary excerpts that we have here, I think balance out a lot of the quote history that we have uh, in this story. But uh, let's look at the third um, panel on this one again, and look at the title of the book. So the title itself, The Splendid and the Vile, doesn't really tell us what it's about. So you go to the subtitle above it, A Saga of Churchill, family and defiance during the blitz. And then you have that wonderful graphic that we just talked about. So I ask a revealing subtitle. Why is it important for Larson to include this descriptive subtitle? Does it give the reader any clues about the meaning of the title? Well, perhaps not about the title itself, but about the content, I would say, of the, the content of the book. So the inspiration for the title. This is a quote from John Colville's diary. And actually, I would like to read an excerpt of that quote so that you have the context of where Larson got his inspiration for this. And this is page 237, 238 if you're in your book, if, if you have it. But um, John Colville leaves checkers the country estate and goes back to his family home on Sunday afternoon. And they had just sat down um, to dinner and the sirens went off. And he says, the night was cloudless and starry with the moon rising over Westminster. Nothing could have been more beautiful than the searchlights interlaced at certain points on the horizon the star-like flashes in the sky where the shells were bursting, 
the light of distant fires all added to the scene. He was watching us out of his bedroom window, of course, with the lights off. It was magnificent and terrible, the spasmodic drone of aircraft overhead, the thunder of gunfire, sometimes close, sometimes in the distance, the illumination like that of electric trains in peacetime as the guns fired, and the myriad stars, real and artificial, in the firmament. And he ends this with, never was there such a contrast of natural splendor and human vileness. So I, I don't know if um, in your reading you went, aha, you had an aha moment. And that explains to us where this, uh, where the title of the book came from. So when you get to the paperback edition, which came out a year later, it has a, it has a, a different um, look to it. And also they took away the saga of, uh, during the subtitle, and it simply says, Churchill, family and defiance during the bombing of London. And then you have this um, arresting uh, kind of collage with Churchill in the foreground, smoke, the bombers, historical buildings, and you get the sense that this is a pretty serious thing that's going on um, right now. Well, Larson, Larson, um, what do I want to say? He, he probably um, drew a little bit on his own background of raising daughters when he took excerpts out of Mary's diary. Mary, a teenager, went through all of the angst and ups and downs and emotional um, peaks and pitfalls um, that teenagers do. And he had, he had kind of a wonderful, uh, wonderful way of um, just taking little tiny clips of this and showing us how very human she was. By the way, Churchill had a, had a very close relationship with his youngest daughter. She adored him. And, and as you know, many of the excerpts it, that she that have been quoted in this book, she stands a little bit in awe of her father and honors him and what he's doing. So um, I, want, I wanted to say though that um, Larson's gift for storytelling brings to life Churchill's qualities of leadership, his quirks, his foibles, and his relationships with his family and friends. He walked or rode through unfathomable destruction of bombed cities, encouraging people to carry on, giving them hope amid the wreckage. Somehow, Churchill knew that his presence gave people courage to pick up the pieces and keep on going. Well, you know, he had a gift for speech. And so these next two slides, I'm going to focus a little bit on that. Um, he became pretty well known for his quick wit and what are known as aphorisms, which really are just pithy statements. And the second one on our, on our graphic says, one of the secrets of a happy marriage is never to speak or to see the loved one before noon. And um, of course, um, another, another aphorism is, um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's not one of his, but that's, what people think of and they think of like a pithy statement or an aphorism. It may have a tiny little uh, gem uh, or germ of truth, but um, sometimes it's just, um, it's just a little saying. But this is our man of the hour. This is a picture of Churchill, um, extremely human. He was not afraid to cry. He loved his cat named Nelson, carried him around with him a lot. And, um, he had uh, at Checkers, which we are going to come to a little bit later, he had some, uh, let his hair down a little bit, let's say that. But first of all, let's go to more about his speech. So there he is. Look at that mob of people around him. And um, his security people must have just about gone crazy. But they all, the mobs, the, the mobs who gathered around him, 
generally were there because they loved him and they wanted they wanted to hear the truth but they also wanted to hear some hope for why why they should keep going why they should go through this um he had a knack for making people feel loftier stronger and more courageous but he would often test ideas out and phrases in the course of ordinary conversation. And we learned that he kept snippets of poems, biblical passages in a special keep handy file. And the diarist John Coville said, to see how, as it were, he fertilizes a phrase or a line of poetry for weeks and then gives birth to it in a speech. So, he did not just speak off the top of his uh, head. He really, um, what do you want to say? He just sort of nurtured ideas until it was the right time to drop one of these phrases that often, you know, those are the quotes that we have today that are that are so memorable. Um, but but his his um, he also. In addition to speech, he also used his body language. Um, by the way, some of these graphics that you're seeing are from the, uh, the publisher website, which has something called the book club kit. And uh, if you're in a book group discussion, I urge you to go um, look at this website because they also have a whole page of discussion questions that are uh, really worthy um, of our time. But to go back to the um, not need for words, down at the lower left corner of the screen, you see a hand reached out a palm, just the palm of the hand. And uh, this note says that he would hold out his hand and say, gimme. And his secretary, Elizabeth Layton, she was expected to know what it was he wanted. Um, he also used the same command to summon people. Gimme prof meant she was to call Lindemann. So um, he had, um, obviously he was a man who had a great deal of respect around him or he couldn't have um, gotten away with, with things like that. I mean, you think maybe that's just a little bit rude, gimme, but it worked, it worked for him. Also um, under this kind of um, assortment of facts that we have, I just wanted to comment on a couple of the other ones. He took two baths a day, which we read about in the book, no matter where he was. On the train, if he was checking into a hotel that had just lost its hot water because it had been bombed, they managed to find enough containers to haul hot water upstairs so he could have his bath. Um, he also had this little quirk about really not liking whistling and we have we ha it says Ch Churchill like Hitler absolutely hated whistling well I did not know that about um, Hitler anyway Churchill and uh, his bodyguard were walking down the street one day as as we read in one of the little anecdotes and uh, they passed a little newsboy who was whistling and Churchill told him to stop it and the kid looked at Churchill and just simply said to him you could close your ears. So they kept on going and um, apparently Churchill broke into a, a smile, a grin, and maybe even a laugh when he got, got away from the boy. So he, he did kind of appreciate the kid standing up for himself, which was, which was such fun. Um, the rest of these, as I say, um, you can spend more time looking at them and just picking up little tidbits. They're bits and pieces that show how very human he was. And because, because of that, I think um, he, had, he had a credibility, a believability about him. Okay, we're going to go on to talk about, uh, uh, oh, first of all, I wanted to ask you, which of his well-known quotes speaks to you and what makes it memorable? So when you get to your uh, breakout groups, you might, um, Think about um, sharing that. And this one of his was from his very first speech at the House of Commons, three days after he became prime minister. And he ended it with this, this saying, I have nothing to offer but blood, 
toil, tears, and sweat. And at the time, there were some comments that it was a, it was a brilliant little speech, but but people just didn't make very much of it. And it wasn't until later that they realized um, the care with which he chose his words and the sincerity behind them. So you just you think about that. I mean, there he was, very brand new prime minister, not making false promises or or pie in the sky, but just telling them, you know, it's going to take blood, toil, tears, and sweat. But you know, we're in this war to win, basically. This um, arresting photograph is in the front of the book. It's the only, it's the only uh, photograph I think that we have in this book. And as I look at it, and I read some of the comments from the observation, um, mass observation diarists who were hired by the government to be kind of keeping a running diary. It was for his sociological studies of British people during the war. But one woman wrote that her house, she had a lot of house guests. Um, there was a lot going on as she uh, was facing every day. And she said, um, two families are here because their houses were wrecked. Well, they were bombed. And um, yet you got the sense, we'll just carry on. And look at the, look at the people standing in this picture. Um, it's hard for me to tell whether they're in a library or, or where they are, but they, they seem to be kind of looking at some kind of display of books. And those men look like they're on their way to work or on the way home from work. So the pluck and courage and perseverance of the British people, um, I still kind of stand, I stand in awe of that, of all of this going on all around them. And, and the people losing their lives and their homes and their and everything. So somebody somebody said to me, just a second, I need to uh, close this out. Somebody said to me, there are an awful lot of characters in this book. How do you keep track of all of them? Well, um, the publishers have done a good job of giving us the categories, the main characters who are British. The Americans and the Germans. And by the way, uh, under the German list, of course, which has um, Hitler and his, his top three people, um, Churchill would not talk about Hitler by name. He always called him that man. It was kind of an interesting way of um, not honoring Hitler. But let's go back to the Brits. You have Winston and his wife Clementine. And she doesn't play a big role in our particular one year here. But as you read a lot of the um, books about Clementine, she was a strong force behind the scenes and a very trusted advisor to Winston. Then the, you next have two of their children, two of their four children, Mary, the one we just talked about, the 17 year old, and Randolph, their son, who was older and he was already serving the country. But he was uh, really kind of the black sheep of their children, um, drinking issues and gambling. And Randolph was married to Pamela, the name underneath his. And um, she's the mother of um, Winston and Clementine's grandchild, uh, Winston Jr. Pamela and Randolph did not stay married, um, but the Churchills loved her and she stayed very close to the family. Colville is the man I've just mentioned several times as um, his private secretary and keeping the detailed diary. Then these next um, three people, um, Ismay, Lindemann, and Aiken, were all in, um, in Churchill's inner circle. Um, Ismay, uh, military chief of staff. Um, Lindemann was an Oxford physicist, and he was um, brilliant and in charge um, I can't remember. Oh, he, he was very responsible for um, figuring out how to um, um, thwart the beams, the beams that the Germans were doing. Um, and then Lord Beaverbrook, who was um, 
He was the Minister of Aircraft Production, but he was also apparently um, the person everybody would go to with all their gossip. <laughs> and so, again, you get these little human quirks. And um, the Detective Inspector Walter Henry Thompson was, was Churchill's police bodyguard. And there's a very touching little anecdote about him when um, America entered the war and uh, Churchill and a whole entourage of people went to see Roosevelt and were staying in the White House and how um, Mrs. Roosevelt honored um, Thompson. So I won't give the whole story away. Lord Halifax had been Neville, Neville Chamberlain's um, uh, foreign secretary. And he eventually became Churchill's ambassador to the United States. So Roosevelt, Harry Hopkins, and Harriman, the three Americans here, play very strong roles. Harry Hopkins was, was Roosevelt's friend and advisor, and, and it was, he, uh, let me say, Churchill curried his favor to get uh, all, all good news back to Roosevelt. Harriman uh, was Roosevelt's special envoy to Europe, and he was apparently um, an enormously attractive and likable man who later on um, became involved with um, Pamela Churchill after she was divorced from Randall. So you have this thumbnail sketch of all of the people who were players in this story. And every one of them gives us kind of a little glimpse of a slightly different viewpoint. So you have, you have I think, a very balanced story here. And my hat is off to Larson for his amazing research and documenting every time he quoted someone. So on the weekends, they would all go to, not all, but many of these people that, that we have just talked about, would go to um, Checkers, the prime minister's residence on the weekends. This belonged to the government, but it was for the use of the prime ministers. And apparently the owner of it, when he, when he gave it to the government said, people were not supposed to work there. They were supposed to go there to relax on the weekends. Well, they did plenty of relaxing on the weekends, but you know that Churchill worked all the time. He, he worked from the bathtub, he did dictation, his poor secretary having to probably sit outside the door on a chair and take the dictation. Um, he, he worked in the car when he was going back and forth to checkers at apparently high speeds and careening around the corners. Um, but they also had amazing uh, dinners. Uh, there was a lot of alcohol available. And um, how interesting that it was a time of rationing for everyone else. But they seemed to find a lot of ways to uh, get around that for visiting guests and that, and that sort of thing. But this was 40 miles away from London and where they spent many, many weekends, the family, the inner circle of the government and friends. And how nice that he had that slight break away, you know, away from Downing Street. So um, I have also an aerial view of Checkers that is, um, you get to see the gardens and um, where, where we, we get some descriptions of people out walking in the gardens just uh, quite, quite a magnificent um, place for them to be. Then I've included this uh, picture of tea because, um, by the way, this is a photograph taken by my daughter uh, when she and I went on a cruise, on one of the print cruises, I was invited to do book talk. And we were going up the St. Lawrence Seaway and every day at four o'clock, in the afternoon, you could go to the top deck and have tea. And they had a string quartet playing and the white tablecloths and of course the lovely sandwiches and sweets and savories. And at four in the afternoon, no matter what you'd been doing, if you'd been on a shore trip or if you'd been on the boat all day, you could just go to that upper deck and sit down and take a long deep breath. 
Well, this is what tea did for the British people. And there was quite an uproar when the rationed tea went from three ounces to two ounces per person. People were drying their tea leaves and using them over again because tea was a universal balm for the trauma of war. And it was the thing that helped people cope. People made tea during air raids and after air raids and on breaks between retrieving bodies from shattered buildings. Oh my, bring on the tea. Tea acquired almost a magical importance in London life, according to one study. And the reassuring cup of tea actually did seem to help cheer people up in a crisis. Tea was comfort and history, but above all, it was English. As long as there was tea, there was England. <laughs> I, just, I, had to, I just had to include that. Um, Now, this is, um, we're getting close to the um, end of my um, presentation, but I, I'm going to leave this up while I, while I talk a little bit more. This was a recent air show that we had here in Duluth, and it's the Thunderbirds flying in formation. And as I watched them go over and, of course, listen to the roar of the jets, I couldn't help but think about the war. And I've been so immersed in this book that, you know, I've been thinking about it a lot. And thinking about the qualities of the people to defend freedom. I mean, perseverance, training, um, courage, vision, just the willingness to go one moment at a time. And really, I think, you know, I'd like to give homage to all the people everywhere who have ever fought for freedom and for democracy. We certainly, we certainly have relevance uh, today with the stories in this book and the war in Ukraine, for example, and other um, challenges that are going on around the globe to, to, to um, take away peace. Well, before we go to my final slide, I have asked myself this question, which I throw out to you as well. What makes this book a compelling read? And here are some of the thoughts that um, have come to me. I liked, as I mentioned, the variety of viewpoints telling the story. I like the balance of war information and personal stories. Then there was a bit of suspense. You know, will the United States come to England's aid and enter the, enter the war? If so, when? Um, will Germany invade England? If so, when? Um, and yet somehow this was balanced by visual descriptions of Winston in his quote, rompers or his siren suit um, and other getup that he wore, uh, really adding a little bit of touch, a touch of humor, I think that, that do bring balance. You have almost visual descriptions of Pug Ismay and Beaverbrook and other characters in the story. And then there's one surprise that I, I will not spoil it for you. It takes place at the White House when uh, Winston is there with his large entourage and Roosevelt comes and knocks on his door at night. So you will have a great chuckle when you, when you get to that. And I like the fact that this book just seemed to move along, but left me with a sense of inspiration. So what will you take away? How has this book changed your thinking about World War II history? What did you learn? And why is this book worth reading? So I'll turn it back to Marilee to go to the breakout room. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Linda, and thank you for your wonderful presentation and for the resource sheet. I'm going to share that resource sheet again in the chat box right now uh, so everyone can access it, and it will also be in the follow-up email that we send within the next couple of days. All for being here tonight.
it was um, such a delight to just have a little uh, glimpse into the various different places. Although I always say I feel like a little bird flying around from one, one room to the next. And I don't mean to offend anyone when I disappear mid-sentence. <laughs> but I just had a couple of comments to make um, as a way of concluding. At, at the end of this book, I, I was thinking, we all need heroes and role models at different times in our lives to inspire us on our journey. And Churchill stands as such a person, having led his country to victory in World War II. He was very human. He had his foibles and failings. He was not universally loved, but he was determined to never surrender. Remember his never, 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 never surrender. That kind of grit, determination, vision, courage, perseverance, still stand as a beacon to all who follow. Thank you again for being here tonight. Happy reading. Yeah, thank you all so much. Stay tuned for future events and future book club picks, and we will just wish you all such a happy rest of your summer and see you again soon. Good night.